You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute and is sponsored by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. Hello, and welcome to your subscribers-only bonus episode of Ben Franklin's World. Thank you for your support, and I hope you're enjoying this holiday season. As the holiday season often involves stuff and the giving of stuff to others, I thought it would be fun to take some time to consider how early Americans created the tools, objects, presents, and items that they needed. How did early Americans create all the things that they needed and wanted in life? Of course, part of this answer is that early Americans didn't always make the things that they wanted and needed. Like we do today, early Americans often imported goods from other places, places like England, continental Europe, and the Caribbean colonies. But as you may recall from episode 292, when we spoke with Glenn Adamson, early Americans could not and did not import everything. They made a lot of what they needed in the colonies and later right in the new United States. So today, we're going to revisit with Glenn Adamson, a scholar who has served as a curator and director of research at several museums, and a scholar who has spent most of his career researching crafts and craft goods so that we can get answers to a few more of your questions that we couldn't address in our full-length conversation. Questions like, what is the relationship between craft tradition and the arts and crafts movement of the late 19th and early 20th centuries? And how and when did Americans transition from engaging in craft work as a livelihood to engaging in craft work for recreation and hobby? And with that, let's go rejoin Glenn Adamson. Glenn, John would like to know if there's a relationship between the colonial craft tradition and the arts and crafts movement. So would you tell us about the arts and crafts movement and whether it had any connections to colonial British American or early United States traditions of craft? Good question, John. Maybe just to briefly explain what the arts and crafts movement is. Really, it's something that happened in the 20 or 30 years around 1900. So starting right there in the late 19th century petering out by about 1920, you might say. And that was a period when, of course, factory production was rapidly becoming the norm. And so the idea was, let's get back to hand making and have high quality objects and high quality jobs. A lot of these folks in America were looking over to William Morris, the great advocate of the arts and crafts movement in England, and adopting his principles of, for example, joy and labor. So they did, in the arts and crafts movement, have a very strong affinity for colonial crafts. In particular, they held up the ideal of the skilled artisan as somebody who, I suppose, had a a kind of emotional attachment and also a sense of pride in their work. And there are some funny things that would happen. For example, arts and crafts metal workers would often leave hammer marks on the hinges or the metal vessels that they were making just to show you that it was handmade. You could see that a hammer was all over that object. Now, of course, an 18th century craftsperson would never have done that because they would have considered it just be unfinished. So someone like Paul Revere, another 18th century silversmith, would always hammer out the metal and make it absolutely smooth. But by the time of the arts and crafts movement, that was coming to be associated with a machine finish. So they would actually leave the surface of the metalwork intentionally rough. Fascinating little inversions like that happen. It might also just be worth saying that after the period of the arts and crafts movement in the 1920s and 30s, that's when you get the really big colonial revival. And that's a slightly different story, more to do with patriotism, trying to impose a sense of national identity on what is really a nation of immigrants. And there's kind of a lot of politics in that story. But there is, in addition to the arts and crafts movements, focus on the colonial craftsperson. There's also a whole other chapter to that story. Now, James would like to know about how the line has shifted between craft for utility, craft for recreation, and craft for livelihood. Would you tell us about the evolution or movement between creating goods for the home or market and creating goods for artistic purposes or perhaps just for fun? Yeah, you know, it it kind of depends what you mean by artistic purposes. I think most people would probably think that any 18th century craft object was artistic in a certain way, 
because it was participating in a culture of style and refinement, a term that some early American historians have used here, meaning that whatever type of object it was, if it was needlework or textiles or woodwork, ceramics, it could be more or less refined. And that would send a strong message about the person who owned it. So you could say that there's kind of artistry that's involved in that refinement, even if it's ultimately about competitive consumption. There is a much later version of the story, which has to do with craft's relationship to fine art, which is a little bit different. And still here, you're really thinking about the post-World War II period and the idea that ceramics could become a form of abstract expressionist sculpture, or woodwork could become modernist abstraction, or fiber art could become some statement about existentialism. That's not really something that we see in American history, though, as I say, until about the 1950s and 1960s. So it's a much later story, but it's an important one. And, you know, now a lot of people debate the relationship between craft and art. And a lot of people would like to see craft as being a major platform for artistic expression in a way that's uh, extremely important to the human condition. So that's another thing that I'm very interested in and talk about in the book a little bit. If this episode piqued your interest in early American craft work, be sure you check out our full length conversation with Glenn in episode 292 which you can find at benfranklinsworld.com slash 292. Can you believe it? The new year is already upon us. In just two days, we will be ringing in 2023. Thank you for spending 2022 with us and for supporting Ben Franklin's World. The transcripts that we began to offer this year and the special episodes and series that we produced happened because of your support. Thank you so much. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Holly White, Ian Tonat, and Dylan Holzer. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. I'll see you on January 3rd with a brand new episode. So I'll see you in a few days. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute and is sponsored by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation.